Hello and welcome to the CFC Markets webinar covering the US banking earnings season. Um, today's date is Wednesday the 17th of July 2019 and the time has just gone uh, 1300 for the summer time or 1pm here in the UK. Uh, I'll just start off as always by leaving the risk warning on screen. Um, it's a very standard morning, uh, essentially it'll keep our compliance department happy. And all it really states is that any of the kind of commentary that I provide today are just merely kind of, you know, my own thoughts and opinions and views. And whatever is co covered in today's webinar shouldn't be construed as explicit trading advice or trading recommendations. So if you could just have a quick read through of the slides. For those of you who are recently really, regularly check out our live webinars or watch the videos we post um, to YouTube, uh, you'll realize it's all fairly standard stuff um, and it's all very very simple and straightforward and once the slides are out of the way we can then press ahead with the actual webinar itself um, so this webinar is going to be covering uh, the, the quarterly figures from the major US banks that have that are reported so far uh, to be fair uh, the bulk of the, uh, the, the bulk of the updates the bulk of the figures have been revealed so far, but obviously we do have Morgan Stanley, one of the big Wall Street players, who reported the numbers tomorrow. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do in the webinar is chat a little about about the um, about the kind of common themes of the the, of the reporting season for U.S. banks so far. Look at what's been compare that how they've been doing versus market expectations. Compare that have been how they've been doing to kind of you know preview how, how they've been doing to the, how they've been doing. In comparison um, with the kind of the, how the, the banking sector has been performing, and there has been a few changes in, the, in how banking has operated the last few years, and also we can talk about uh, this the topics and the ideas that we cover for U.S. banks could be uh, in some ways uh, be used as a comparison for whenever we get the European banks, uh, the U.K. banks, and the Eurozone banks report their, their figures. At the end of the day, they're all in the same game. Uh, and, and we and we look about what 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 arose in the U.S. banks. Could we see something similar in the um, in the European banks when they reveal their figures? I'm happy to if you have any questions, feel free to kind of fire away. For the time being, at least, could we just keep it in relation to the banking sector, the U.S. banking sector, at least for the, for the first while? Uh, towards the end of the, of the webinar, as we approach half past one, so at about 25 minutes time, I'm happy then to actually be spare time talk about. Um, in, you know, the markets in general, but if you could just keep it focused on the U.S. banking sector for the time being, uh, we'll start off with uh, with Citigroup. Um, they were the first ones of the major banks to uh, to report their figures. And if you take a look at the kind of headline figures um, from Citigroup, we're actually we're actually quite decent and fairly well received. Uh, so if you take a look at, at the Citigroup numbers uh, in relation to um, the earnings and what have you. Um, the earnings per share uh, uh, earnings per share came in at one dollar ninety five cents. That was better than expected because markets were expecting um, a movement uh, a EPS of one dollar eighty. Revenue also came in slightly better than expected. It came in at eighteen billion um, point seven six eighteen point seven six billion US dollars. Well, the consensus estimate was for, for something in the region of around eighteen point five. So that was slightly better than expected. But it's also worth remembering that, that actually. That, in, that revenue actually slipped by 2%, so it was a slight decline um, in, in revenue for Citigroup, but it didn't manage to beat expectations. Uh, one of the areas, um, some of the, the trading departments at Citigroup were a bit subdued, if I recall. Um, various different uh, trading departments, um, be it across um, the financial markets, was a bit subdued, but City Citigroup has a bit, for a for Wall Street Bank, has a bit more of a, of a retail um a sizable retail division and the global consumer bank posted a three percent increase in revenue um and so if you, so if you consider that um if you think about that the overall revenue actually declined by two percent but the but the but the global consumer bank showed a three percent rise in revenue so it really kind of shows you that that was essentially the kind of the main one of the, one of the better performing departments in the bank so if it, was, if it was more investment banking focused, if it was more trading focused, it's likely we could have had uh, even worse numbers from Citigroup. It's also worth pointing out that unfortunately, uh, rev, um, it's also worth pointing out there was, a, there was there was a gain of a few hundred million dollars 
uh, three hundred fifty million dollars in relation to the, uh, the the sale of um of, of trade web. So that was sort of a one off one off number. But what was interesting about the about this um is that the city group numbers show show are kind of a, bl a br blueprint for what is is going on in the kind of wider banking sector post post credit crisis. Banks are being are taking on far less risk. They've been trimming down the size of their proprietary trading desks. So essentially, where, where, where traders are looking to trade the financial markets with the bank's money, that's deemed to be too risky. They're spending much more on, on compliance and, and, and auditing and in relation to regu tighter regulations. And they're also kind of going back to kind of bread and butter stock, whereby if they have a retail bank, as Citigroup does, focus more on actually kind of everyday retail banking. It isn't as glamorous as you know as, as the trading departments, but guess what? It's actually lower. It's, it's lower risk, and it's actually kind of really much getting kind of back to basics. And and, and for organisations which don't have of any or a very small retail bank, they've been focusing more on things like wealth management, investment banking, uh, advisory investor advisory fees through investment banking and advice. Merge and acquisition advice, IPO, bond issuances. So things whereby investment banks or banks in general receive a um, charge a fee for, for their services as opposed to actually risking their own money. So it was, a, by and large, it was a good set of numbers from Citigroup. And, but now that the sentiment has changed a bit in relation to what's going on with the, with the prospect of the, Federal, of the Federal Reserve cutting rates, um, in relation to all the chatter about rate cuts, you know, there's still about a 27% chance of a rate cut of 0.5% from the Federal Reserve this month, and there's quite a high probability of a, of a rate cut of 0.25% this month. Essentially, banks perform better um, in, an, in a high in, higher interest rate uh, environment. So, if, if the interest rates are about to be high and the perception is you're going to get even higher, that bodes well for banks uh, in, in terms of how, how, how they actually um, how they kind of structure their lending or, or, whereby what they borrow from, from, the, from the markets or from other banks and what they dole out to consumers in terms of actual um, in terms of lending rates that in itself is actually a key area for the bank uh, it's, but essentially it's called like the, the net interest income is, is the name of it whereby it's essentially the difference between how much you pay out and how much how much you pay out on deposits and how much you charge on loans and in an environment of higher interest rates and the, and the and possibility of even higher rates, that usually bodes well. But now, when we're seeing the prospect of, of lower rates in the Federal Reserve, that co that compresses bond yield. The kind of the gaps uh, between, say, the two-year yield and the ten-year yield, um, it, pr pressure gets put on that. It narrows, and therefore ba banks usually have fewer opportunity, have, have less of an opportunity to make money. So, kind of going forward. For Citigroup, if we do have rate cuts from the Fed, uh, a rate cut from the Fed later this month, and, and, and prospect of more rate cuts, that's likely to get impact future earnings. So, if you take a look at the, at the share price action of Citigroup for the last throughout 2019, major rebound in start the beginning of the year. It's broadly traded sideways for, for a few weeks. Um, then a push down higher to a multi-month high in April, followed by another 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 sell-off. But notice how with the um, the highs, notice how the um, the lows of, um, of, of 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 May and June failed to take off the lows of March. Then the market pressed on higher yet again. So what we can see here is in around the kind of seventy-two dollars range for for uh, Citigroup. It seems to be a bit of an area of resistance. It failed to, it failed to break above that area properly. Uh, at the end of April, and we see you're kind of running into that resistance level yet again. Turning our attention to the MACD histogram, the MACD indicator, we can see there's a steady decline in positive momentum, uh, and because of that, it could suggest that the kind, of, the kind of buying pressure is running on a bit of steam. So we might see the market drift a bit lower. If we do see the, the stock drift a bit lower, support could be found in this blue line here, the 50-day moving average, which comes into play at 67 spot 30 spot 37 and even if you drop below that support could be found from this red line here in around 64 spot 67 which is a 200 day moving average but bearing in mind it's been broadly in a bullish trend throughout 2019 so if we do manage to press on higher from here we could be looking at targeting this area here a level last seen in late september 2018 up around the kind of 75 dollars um, per share mark 
to take a quick look at some of the questions that have been coming through. Yes, as um, as as you, as you get a question, question Kieran, about the possibility uh, of rate cuts. Yes, I think going if you do have rate cuts, if you do have a rate cut in July and the prospect of further rate cuts throughout 2019, we could see we could see we could see um, that impact um, banking's the bank's uh, net interest income um, metric, which is a very important metric because as, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially the difference between what banks pay you in deposit versus what they charge you in loans. If that if that percentage gets squeezed, we could see l l lower profit margins, and uh, one of the one of the banks they didn't end up going lower on it. In relation to how much the potential movements in the in the, in the banks of the S and P, we've had how they impact the big indices. To be honest, not a whole lot. I know they're very, for, for, I know they're obviously big. Um, I mean, corporate stories, but we haven't seen much of a move. And given that a lot of the move on, say, what has driven U.S. stocks higher in recent weeks and months has been the slight improvement between U.S.-China trade relations, but more so the the belief that the Federal Reserve are going to loosen monetary policy has been the, kind of probably the largest driver of uh, of of, uh, of the, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, and everything kind of got brought up along with that. So I think at the moment it's fair to say what the Fed do and what goes on between the US and China is probably going to have a bigger impact. If we do see, obviously, we, you know, traders often like to often go, right, we've had a good run, let's look to take some profits. And if, if the numbers aren't good, that could be an excuse to actually look to take profits from there. But, you know, so far, most of the big, most of the big numbers you've seen out from uh, the US banks have been fairly positive, but we didn't really see that kind of massive surge come along. Uh, take a look now at Goldman Sachs. Taking a look at, once again, by and large, these, these numbers were quite good. So if you take a look at Goldman Sachs numbers, earnings per consumer share came in at $5.81, topping the forecast comfortably uh, because the forecast was $4.89. Um, revenue for the period came in at just shy of $9.5 billion. Once again, uh, it was ahead of expectations. Um, what's, what's, what, is, what is useful is the fact that the investment banking revenue. So once again, we're talking about how banks want to spend, want to earn money through fees rather than actually risking their own money more so. Uh, that came in better than expected. It came in at 1.8 billion dollars. And if you look, and also probably because some of the trading departments have been kind of beaten up quite badly at major banks, you could say expectations were lower going into it. But the but the but the revenue derived from equity trading uh, top forecasts. But at the same time, um, the revenue um, from the fixed income, currency, and commodity trading uh, came in um, below below forecast. So it goes to show you the kind of in comparison with say the eurozone debt crisis and the credit crisis uh, all those kind of years ago, volatility in the financial markets has dropped off considerably in comparison to what it was in say 2011 or 2008. And because of that, some of these banks are actually some of these banks, particularly like Goldman Sachs. Who had disproportionately a large amount of their revenue coming from the trading departments? They've seen the, they've seen um, the, their business being impacted by that, and they've been pushing away from the trading and more t towards what I mentioned, the invest banking side. So even though you know fixed income currencies and commodities or FIC is the acronym that, that a lot of analysts and traders have been using recently, even though that can kind of below expectations, it's sort of a bit of a kind of old, it's sort of not as important as it once was, just because. Traders got used after a few quarters, got used to the idea of having not so impressive um, fixed income, currency, commodity numbers, but focusing on investment banking. And the fact that even though the bank has been making a concerted effort to gain more fees on the investment banking side, the advisory side, the advice side, the fact that the top of those numbers tells me that the bank are, are kind of content to kind of move in that direction. And you know, the top figures, which are already going into it, um, traders would, would have had higher expectations. Now, if you take a look at the share price here at Goldman's, it's, it's a very similar move across the board. We obviously had a big sell-off in, in, uh, in U.S. equity markets at back end of last year and a push higher throughout 2019. Major sell-off at the back end of last year. The market rebounded in early January. Kind of common enough, stayed in a, in a relatively small, small trading range, um, um, essentially between, say, late January and also up, to, up until, up until um, April. 
drifted lower and notice how there's a sell-off uh, in late in late March did manage to take off the sell-off take off the lows of um, March but when the market did manage to kind of hit an upward trend the highs here have taken off the, um, the highs of April and only yesterday we hit a level last seen since November last year so, so we're at multi so we're at you know heading towards you know multi-month highs on Goldman Sachs share price there's a solid upward trend it's looking it's looking as if we're going to be heading up towards this region here in around the kind of 220 and if you take out 220 we could be looking at targeting this area here a level last seen um, in early November last year at $234 um, what's interesting about the Goldman Sachs chart is this red line here the 200 day moving average and the 200 day moving average by, by some traders you follow technical analysis often view that as kind of a good benchmark of whether a market is a, is is, a, is strong or weak bullish or bearish and you can see here that if you go back to um we, we go back as far as um a couple of years ago uh, october last year we can see that once the market managed to tra trade above the 2 moving average in september last year it held above it for quite a few months and then when the sentiment turned and it dropped back below it, it struggled to get back above it. So the previous support of the 30 moving average then became resi resistance. And this is pretty common, um, whereby all support becomes new resistance. Notice how when the market dropped below it, the, the sentiment turned. It created a multi-month low by, by, by moving down here. It took out those lows, created a multi-month low. And then what happened? The market pushed higher, ran into resistance of the 30 moving average, created another multi-month low. Market tried to retest the 200 moving average up here, failed to do so, and it's been holding below it uh, for, for, for much of 20, late 2018 and 2019. We can see here on a few occasions um, in 2019 in April and May, it tried to get back above it, but it failed to do so. But once it did manage to break above it, 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 made, a, you know, it made a sizable jump above it as it's pushing higher from it. So this is a good example of how previous uh, res you know, well, of old, old support became new resistance and the new resistance could potentially become old support so keep an eye out for the two of the moving average in Goldman Sachs it's only really if you kind of drop below that metric could then we be get could then we be getting be begin to think you know the, the wider negative trend from uh, from last summer from July 18 is actually going to be in play Take a look now at JP Morgan Chase. With the new economy. So I'm taking here a look at JP Morgan Chase. Uh, a quick look, have a look at the figures. JP Morgan Chase were by and large a good set of numbers, but the outlook um, was a bit was lowered slightly. So if we take a look at the numbers, revenue increased by by um, by four percent to twenty nine point five seven billion. Topping the expectations of 28.9 billion, so a bit better expected on the on the number on the uh, the revenue. In terms of actual um, EPS earnings per share, increase is a 16% increase on the year. Came out of two two dollars and 82 cents a share. Um, topping the estimate comfortably because because the estimate was two dollars and 50 cents per share. But what was concerning about this, or a bit disappointing rather. Um, the net interest income, which I mentioned before, the gap, how much money the bank earns on lending, you know, the difference between it pays you in, in deposits versus what it charges you for lending. Um, essentially, the, um, the the forecast was they actually ended up producing the forecast ever so slightly by about 500 million. Um, to so that they so going forward they expect to make about 500 million less on interest, and this could be the sign of of banks actually feeling the effects of the changes in the, in the bond market we've seen in the US government bond market we've seen whereby rates are, or yields are being driven lower the kind of the gap between say that the, the shorter term yield shorter term, shorter term yield and say the two year 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 year, year yield versus the 10 year yield that's getting compressed it's making it probably make, it's likely to make it more difficult for banks to earn money in the future quarter so the fact that they had good numbers in the quarter just gone but they they they, they they slightly lower their guidance on terms of how much money they're going to make on loans for the, for the future quarter that end up actually weighing um, on the share price on that day. That being said, they have a massive knock-on impact on the stock. It's still by and large in good shape and it's still by and large um, an, an upward trend throughout 2019. But you will notice 
at the highs here that are recorded in July haven't yet taken out the highs uh, in May whereas we have seen other banks like Goldman Sachs go on to press on to multi-month highs if we do continue to press on higher from here and we take off this level here the highs that were achieved in late, late April at around $116.70 in the region here we could be looking at targeting this area here up at $119 spot 25 moves the downside might find some support from this balloon line here the 50 day moving average in at 110 spot 83 and even if you go below that the 30 day moving average at 107 spot 19 might act as support um take a look now at the last one of the, of the kind of, of the um the last one of the banks that were out yesterday at wells fargo and what's what's the really thing about wells fargo is that it's actually a major uh, i think it's wells fargo is one of if not the biggest um mortgage lender in the united states so it's very much focused on what's going on in the u.s mortgage market and as we can see here unlike the other ones such as goldman sachs which derive money from trading and and uh, and also investment banking fees the share price action of Morgan Stanley has been very, Wells Fargo rather has been very much to the downside, and we can and, and explain here how, how, why here with the figures. So the earnings per share yesterday one dollar thirty cents, comfortably beating the estimate of one dollar fifteen. Revenue came in at twenty one point five eight billion, topping the forecast of twenty point nine three billion. But uh, in terms of net net interest interest income. Um, it came in slightly below expectations and it talked about a lower in, lower uh, interest rate environment and that's kind of a bit of a forewarning that we could be looking at future future uh, declines in that department for the bank that put a bit of pressure on the share price very large move to the downside you know the, the, the wider trend has been very much to the downside we can see here that you know, the grass is set off um, to the downside we can see here on the on the um, on the momentum you look at the momentum here it's swung from positive momentum to negative momentum if we do press on lower from here we could be looking targeting this area here in a 42 spot apologies 40 spot 20 and a move below that could be looking at retesting the december lows within around 43 dollars a share notice how on a few occasions this yellow line here the one day moving average which comes into play at 47 spot 59 on a few occasions it did manage to act at resistance and once again active resistance here here and along here and what do you know only a few weeks ago it, well it traded slightly above it but you know the area didn't, didn't really, really get it didn't really get a, a proper break above it so we can see here that the one day moving average is likely to be another uh, resistance point should the market push on higher from here there's a, there's a comment here from uh, Kieran Yes, I fully agree. Clear is up our trend, and like I and like I said, this is no, no, especially in light of the fact that the Fed are, look, are looking at cutting rates. It really is kind of no surprise. And I just, as you as you rightly rightly um pointed out, it's one of the clearest examples uh, of the downward trend. So if we do press on lower from here, we could be looking at retesting the May lows and then possibly even um, below that the December lows. And I think if you go below that, we could be looking at heading down towards 40 bucks, 40, 40, 40 bucks per share. I'll take a look now at uh, talk me through Bank of America's numbers. They came out only a couple of hours ago. Um, so take a look now at the uh, these figures here. So if you look at the um, the uh, the Bank of America shares along here. Apologies, uh, my modern system isn't as working as fast as I would like it. So Bank of America was reported earnings per share, um, 74, 74 cents a share. Uh, we can see that the um, the FIC revenue, the fixed income currency and commodity revenue was down 8%, was down 8 as, as hardly a surprise there given that the um, a lot of the banks have been, have been going through the similar situation. We can see that their revenues revenues for the um, on, on trading on equity trading was down 13 percent we can see there was a nice increase in uh, in quarterly net interest income so once again the bank 
we can see that the trading departments aren't doing so well, but the issue of net interest income um, with a size, a nice increase in that. And this is probably going to be where banks are going to be focusing more on. Back to basics, um, do things like mortgages and, and loans um, as opposed to actually being overly dependent on the financial markets for money. Obviously, the shares, the, the markets open in about an hour's time, so we obviously haven't, haven't seen any, any kind of price action movements so or any price action so far. And just take a look now. I can see here some of the headlines saying that in the pre-market it dips after the quarter after the quarter after the quarter results. But then again, Bank of America they they claimed to boost its dividend by 20% uh, and increase the pace of share buybacks. So that should act as a bit of a buffer um, to the um, to the numbers. So we can see that that was a, that was a considerable beat. Um, EPS came in at 70, 74 cents per share, um, where the issue will, whereas, whereas the um, consensus was 63 cents. So a considerable beat on the on the earnings front. That interest income rose by three percent. So by and large, we think obviously the, the the numbers out of the in relation to the um the numbers in relation to the fixed income uh, currency and, and commodities division weren't weren't so impressive, and neither were uh, the equities numbers. But overall, it seemed to be actually a fairly decent set of numbers. So take a look at chart for Bank of America. It's obviously not going to be open yet. Be open in about a one a one hour's time. So Bank of America, uh, reasonably similar situation whereby it had a decent bounce back at the begin beginning of the year. There's a sell-off uh, between basically throughout the month of May, but the market has been creeping higher. But notice how the, the highs of July haven't taken off the highs of, uh, of May, so we're still haven't really kind of shaken off the kind of wider downward trend. If we do manage to kind of press on higher from here and take out the uh, the levels, um, the highs of, of, um, of August, we could be looking at be heading towards seventy-one dollars and sixteen cents here, this region here. And should we go beyond that, we could be looking at heading up towards the thirty-two dollars per share region. If we do manage to drift lower and we and head head back below the maturity moving average in at twenty-eight dollars and eighteen cents, we could take us back down towards this region here and the lows of June, which are in around twenty-six dollars and forty-one cents. Just actually out of, out of curiosity, uh, this is, this was, it was something that relatively new that we tried holding a, a webinar in the middle of the day. Um, we were fully aware that at the um, at the U.S. markets um, were, were going to be open for another 60 minutes, but we figured as it's in the daytime, individuals might be might be easier to find easier to, to log in at um, at one o'clock rather than say you know half half two or three p.m. Because out of out of, out of a quick kind of poll, any is there any any kind of, a kind of preference if we were to have another similar webinar? What time would uh, would work would work for them? Does half does, does a one o'clock start work for them, or do they prefer more of a, a two fifteen half two start? Feel free to uh, uh, add your comments in there. Just see a see a comment here. And just look at the comments here. Uh, looks like it went up with US indices from the end of US results. Uh, yes, it, in terms of in terms of the the last, the last few months, absolutely. But and still a bit. I was told you could be more confident that the upward trend was was going to is going to continue if um if if um if the share price managed to take out. The, the highs, the, if the highs of July took off the highs of, uh, of, of May. When I was referring to the, the wider downward trend, I was talking about, say, late, basically most of 2018 was a pretty bad year for um, for the bank. So we're, we have regained most of the ground, but you know, if you've taken out, if you take out the April highs, we may be looking at highs not that seen since August last year, and then you can be more confident I think that that recent trend, that wider trend, will, will play out. It's just gone half past one. Um, 
any, if any, any, just before we look to kind of wind things up, are there any comments you'd like to make in relation to what, when, when is a good time for you to hold a webinar in the daytime? And also any, any comments in relation to, you know, the financial markets in general, be it indices or currencies or commodities? I do have time for a, a couple of questions. For those of you who have commented uh, in, in relation to the, the feedback to answer you, what is okay for you, what would, what, what would be good for you, thank you for that. Um, all feedback is welcome. You are most welcome. For those of you who thanked me, absolutely, no, no, uh, no worries, my pleasure. There will be a recording of this video on our YouTube channel. It will also be posted to our trading platform under the Insights section. You're welcome, Kieran. No, no problem. Happy to help. Bye to you. Um, so seeing, seeing as everyone seems to be wrapping up there, I'll look to, look to finish up the webinar. I do appreciate your time for logging in. If you have any comments to make on this webinar or any of the events uh, that we look to actually um, cover, any of the, of the events we actually look to cover, any of the videos we, we produced, feel free to leave a review uh, on Google Reviews. Um, if you look to, um, to if, if for those of you that are going to be visiting the office, feel free to, to give me a shout. Um, you can, the best way to contact me is probably via Twitter, um, or else if, if you have a, a contact at the company, feel free in terms of sales trader or broker that, that takes care of your, your account. Just give him or her a, a heads up. Uh, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you very much for tuning in and speak soon. Have a good day.